grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The text for our message this morning is the text appointed for this gospel, this fourth Sunday after the Epiphany, with particular focus on these words. An unclean spirit, and it cried out, calling, Why? Why, and you, Jesus of Nazareth, why did you come to destroy us? I recall you, whom you are, the Holy One of God. Thus for our text. I was talking to our much loved secretary this morning and she and I share a common problem. She worded it this way, I think it was, I press my buttons too fast. We kind of chuckle at each other because we often make common mistakes that really should not go by anybody. She didn't know this, but I did, and I caught it this morning, thanks be to God, because I'm about to tell you, and that is to stay, speak as a prophet of God. And it says, despise not prophecy. And I'm about to prophesy. Earlier this week, Brother Tom can tell you, and this coming Tuesday, I'm about to do it again. But I send things out to our brethren this week, about 40 brothers, translations and notes on the Gospels. <laughs> and I translated the word I as we. Now I know this may seem silly, but that's something I just should not do. But sometimes when you get some measure of ability, you start to think you know something and you do it fast. And then you find yourself foolish. Because when you go through it again, you think you know what it says and you just write it down. See, there's this story in the back of my head. Jesus asks a demoniac, that is a guy who has demons inside of him. Notice demons. There's a S on the end, more than one. Who are you? And he says, Legion, for we are many. And of course, that's the back of my mind. And when I'm reading through this story in the Greek language, that is in the back of my mind. And how many times have I told you the first thing we must do is put out of our minds when we read the Word of God, when we read these words, first thing we must do is put away from our mind all of our presuppositions and assumptions so that we can hear the word of God, the word of Christ by the power of his spirit so we can hear him and not our voice in the back of our brain. Don't I say that often? You're probably tired and weary of me saying it. And yet, it's true. I know I said last week and I sound like some braggadocio fool. But actually, I want to make sure that you understand I am a fool. So did you get that? I'm not bragging. I'm doing just like St. Paul said when he said, by the Holy Spirit, I speak as a fool. You see, he wasn't joking and neither am I. I'm speaking as a fool, so you will get it. It may appear to you that I'm highly educated and smart. I'm smart enough to be a moron. I only know enough now that I don't know anything. Do you hear me? I know a lot of fancy words. And I can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with just about anybody and sound like I'm smart. Truly, I'm smart enough to know that I really... What I do know is a lot less than I don't. Way. So much so that when I'm trying to hear God speak to me through the words of his apostles, I can't even translate the very first word 
that my two-year-old granddaughter knew before she was two. In that right, Ava J. That's where she looks and says, hi, Grampy. But do you understand? I'm not trying to puff myself up at all. What I'm trying to do is to teach you exactly what the apostle says when he says, let no one think more highly of himself than he ought. And I'm not just giving you some self-deprecating or self, I don't know how to say it any other way, because I'm not that smart. I don't know how to make fun of myself in such a way that you believe I'm being honest. Because most people that do that are trying to do that so you can say good things about me. I'm actually not. I'm trying to tell you that I understand who I am. Inside of me wants to think I'm somebody, but I actually know I'm not. But I want to teach you these things so you get it. I've been, now, the point I was trying to make before I took five minutes to explain it so you got what I'm trying to say now. I've been studying the scriptures devotedly for over 45 years. That's the truth. Now, that does not make me somebody. But I'm telling you quite honestly, I have devotedly studied the scriptures for 45 years. And before that, like most people, kind of, sort of, which means I read it pretty good, but for 45 years, I took notes, and I got notebooks, and all, I mean, I've wrecked more Bibles than people, most people buy in their lifetime. And I've never thought of it as a badge of courage to keep one so that it looked like it was worn out, so I looked like somebody. I just threw them away and got new ones, because I didn't, I got tired of the pages falling out. The point of that is, is when you start doing that, and before you learn other languages, you think you start to know these things, and you've read them 10,000 times, literally. I don't want to say that. I don't know how many times, literally. A bunch of times. You think you know what it says, and so you kind of skip over the words. And that's a problem. And that's the beautiful thing about learning other languages. You have to slow down. But then you start to get those languages down, and you start reading fast, and then you do dumb things like translate it wrong and think you know it because you're getting to be as good at those as you were at English, and that's bad. And God humbled me again today, and it's a good thing because that's where today's message is. Okay, I've taken a long time to do what you probably shouldn't do if you're preaching to tell them how you got to where you're at, but it's important because part of the message is today is to teach you to study carefully and slowly. It's not a race. You don't have to read five chapters an hour or two books a day. Yes, it is very good over the course of 30 days to read the whole Bible. I would recommend that highly because it gives you a great overhead picture, but it's also at the same time very great to spend a day on five verses or five words because you can get a lot out of one. Sometimes studying one word means you have to study 500 verses or more. So here's today's message. That was the first part. First part, read slowly. Take your time. Meditate on the words that are before you. And don't think you know what they mean. Because like me, you probably don't. Now I find it everybody I'm talking to today, and yes, you people at home. Straightway there was in the synagogue, because they were traveling into Capernaum. When? Well, that is after he called his disciples, who, as you heard last week, he was calling them into battle, not to go on a fishing trip. Fishing for men was not on a recreational journey. He was calling them into a war between good and evil. It's not hyperbole. Jesus was calling his troops into battle. It is a war between good and evil. Christianity against the rest of the world. There are only two religions. I've said it before. I'll say it again. There is no such thing as Abrahamic religions. I don't care who tells you so. They may have sprung from Christianity. 
but they're nothing like it. Only Christianity teaches that you can approach God because God has first approached you and made you righteous, declared you righteous, and therefore, believing that, you indeed, being declared righteous, can live your life with a clean conscience. What do you do to wake up in the morning to please God? Nothing. He's already provided himself a lamb. He's already provided the sacrifice for your atonement, your redemption. You need do nothing except believe it's true and therefore live a life pleasing to him. You must not, cannot do anything to please him. He is already pleased in his son. That's the first message of the battle before he cast him out <coughs> into the desert. Behold, my beloved son, in whom I have been well pleased. I've been pleased with your baptism. I am pleased with your person. And will continue to be. And then the spirit drove him into the desert. Where he was being with the wild beasts. And the angels were ministering to him. And then they're traveling into Capernaum. And straightway. There's three straightways in this short eight pat verses. They're kind of like a, a little structure. Sets this. It's really kind of cool. Straightway during the Sabbath. Straightway, there was in the synagogue, and straightway his report came out into the whole region. It kind of sets up a little structure so you can, Mark is trying to focus us. Mark is trying to put this in a little structure so we can see it, and the middle straightway gives us the meat of the sandwich. It's like the first straightway is the top bun, the last straightway is the bottom bun, and the middle straightway is all the burger. Or if you're a vegan, the portobello mushroom with the cheese. No, you can't have cheese. The non-dairy cheese. Yes, I have vegan friends. And yes, I like portobello mushroom burgers too. All right, the first straight way. During the Sabbath, traveling unto Capernaum, Jesus entered the synagogue and he was teaching. Straight way he was teaching. That's the first straight way. He was customary, and it says during the Sabbath, it's plural. So it was his customary thing on every Sabbath to go into the synagogue straightway and to be teaching. Now what about this teaching? They were overwhelmed. Why? For he was teaching them as one who had authority, not like the scribes. Some translations, the teachers of the law. It says scribes, so that's what I translate too. Now what's that mean? Well, the scribes or the teachers of the law teach just like the Supreme Court. None of them say this is what the law says anymore. This is what they say. Well, so-and-so said this, and so-and-so said that, and so-and-so said that. Therefore, we must say that. Why? Because this is what they said before, and it can't be wrong what they said before, so this is what it says. Do you understand the difference between that and Jesus? Because Jesus says, you have heard it said once, this and once that. But I tell you, do you recognize those words of Jesus? You have said, you have heard it said, thou shalt not murder. But I tell you, he who says to his brother, Raha, that is, thou fool, is in danger of the hellfire. Do you remember that passage? You see, Jesus tells them what it means. Thou shalt not murder. You see, it's in the heart. It's not just raising a hammer to slay Abel or a rock. It's not just murdering somebody, but it's in your heart wanting to kill you, you son of a gun, you. Now, you've all said those words, only words, just like I have. You've all flipped somebody off driving down the road because he cut you off or put you in a ditch. Let's not pretend this is real world and I'm a real preacher. So was John the Baptist and so was Jesus. When he said, you who were without sin cast the first stone, he was not playing a game. 
He knew what was in a man. He didn't need their testimony. When he pointed the finger, every single one of them left. Why? Because he knew. Now, maybe they knew that because he looked him in the eye and his eyes communicated that. We learn a lot from face to face. That's why I hate phone calls. I'd much rather talk to you face to face because you know I'm being honest and sincere with you. And I can tell I'm not Jesus. But we learn a lot through micro expressions, they call it. But Jesus was way above that. He could read hearts. He didn't need to see what happened with the little twinkle on the side of my eyeballs or whatever they call that. I don't know, whatever. But you get it. He was teaching him as one who had authority. Why? Because he was the one who wrote, Thou shalt not murder. Not kill, murder. And obviously it's not murder to put to death someone for capital punishment because he himself wrote after the time of Noah. He who dies, he who takes the blood of a man, by man shall his blood be shed. How can it be murder to put to death somebody who's murdered somebody? It can't be. Because God commanded it. That can't be murder. Yes, you're killing, but that's not murder. You say, okay, you're splitting hairs. Well, if God commanded me to split a hair, I'll split a hair. I didn't write it. You argue with him. When you get there, you argue with him. I'm just going to proclaim what he says. When he says, thou shalt, a man shall not lie with another man as with a woman, you can argue with him if you want. I'm just going to proclaim it. And if I'm the most unpopular guy in the world, that doesn't mean I hate either of those men. Ask those men who do that if I hate them. They know I don't. I hug them every time I see them. And say, I love you, brother. You ask them. It's true. But it doesn't mean I say it's okay. If they ask me, and they don't, because they already know. We've talked. But I don't run around a sign at their funeral say, God hates fags. That's ridiculous. They already know what I preach. But I'm not going to change preaching what God commands me to say because a false prophet should die too. And I'm not a false prophet, nor by his grace and mercy ever become one. I don't have a congregation of 10,000. That doesn't mean if you do, you're a false prophet. But it's not a popular thing to say homosexual marriage isn't marriage, nor should it be. It doesn't attract the whole town. And perhaps that's why part of our country is going through part of what it is now. Because our country as a whole has itching ears and Christians have been silent for way too long. That's why our forefathers did indeed say this country only works for a moral people. But I digress. Second straightway signals the meat. There was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. That should have signaled me I should have never ran fastly and translated I to we. See, I had his marker. If I wouldn't have been traveling so fast, if I wouldn't have been going faster than the speed limit, I would have caught the marker, right? See, God gives us signs before we get to the place so we don't break the law. God will tell you in your head, don't do that. How many times has he done you and said, oh, it's okay this one time. You see how sin works? It's in your brain first before it comes out of your, mem your members, your hands. How many times has he said, oh, you shouldn't do that. Oh, you shouldn't, oh, just this one time. And then you end up doing 10 times. How many of you start smoking a cigarette? Oh, let me just see what it's like. Next thing you know, you're smoking two packs a day. How many of you started with your first drink and say, well, that's not too bad. Kind of tastes good. Well, when you get buzzed, that's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, seriously, all of us started doing those things that way. Or you're so upset, you take a pill. Or you hit a joint. Whatever. We're all the same inside of us. We hate pain. I understand that. I'm no different than anybody else. We are all the same. 
and it starts in our heart and our head. None of us likes to hurt. Hurting hurts. And we all run from it because no one likes it. And that's normal. Anyone who tells you that's not normal is insane. Jesus screamed on the cross. It hurt. He both cried out in pain and anguish because, first of all, he knew he didn't deserve it. But secondly, he was human, fully human, but not sinfully human like you and me. So let's, let's not pretend Christianity is this thing where you, everyone smiles all the time and everyone's happy. It's definitely not. Ask those Christians who are over in the Middle East now suffering terribly or in China who are locked up, who would dare to believe. We've got it made over here. Just people think we're goofy. So what? Some of my friends don't talk to me, the ones I had when I was growing up, because I was a clown. I was a nice clown. I loved everybody, still do. People I run across that I knew from high school said, you know, the cool thing about you is you were friendly to everybody. Yes, I was. Because I knew what it was like for people to hate me. I knew what it was like to hurt. And if you're hurting, I know. I grew up that same crappy way you did. And I laughed a lot, so I didn't cry all the time. I know what it feels like to want to escape. And maybe that this guy in this text did too. Maybe that's how he ended up with this unclean spirit. I don't know. And I'll get back to that in a minute. But it says that the unclean spirit was in him, and when Jesus came near him, it cried out. Some translations say he, but he didn't. It did. How do I know that? Because what came out of its mouth? Why? Now, most translations say, what do we have to do with you? He didn't say we. The text says he, singular. I'm a stickler. It's what the text says. That's what the word of God is, not what I think. And that's why I'm so glad God, the Holy Spirit, caused me to look at it again. So I don't teach you falsely. It's in these words. Why? And it does here say us and you. I think I just misspoke a second ago. The singular I is next. It does say why. Us and you, Jesus of Nazareth. Doesn't say, what do we have to do with you? That's what they put it in there, so it doesn't sound all sixth grady like me. But the words are actually, why? Or what? Could translate it what to? What? Us and you, Jesus of Nazareth. Put in your best Uncle Vinny. What? Us and you. It's one of those kind of conversations. It's not a deep conversation. It's somebody you don't want to see. What? Do you get it? That's the kind of conversation. It's a devil coming across the Holy One. And he says it. Have you come to destroy us? That's a plural, us. Now there's only one demon. It's not like legion. And that's why I got confused and just kept going on quick. But it does say us. What does that tell us? What does this text from St. Mark tell us? In fact, the title of the book is According to Mark. Have you come to destroy us? This has consequences for all of us. You watching at home and here and me. Have you come to destroy us? Some people and some people who talk about this text say, well, he's talking about himself and the fellow demons who aren't there. You could say that. You could interpret it that way. But they're not there. And Mark is talking about this man and this demon. Have you come to destroy us? It says. What has Jesus taught us about the state of a man and demons? Now I'll go to another book because I'm preaching on Mark. I'll go to another book. Jesus said in another place, in another way. 
if it cast out demons, I'm going to paraphrase. I don't have it written down. If I cast out demons and make the inside of a man clean and swept, and a demon should come along and find its place swept and garnished, I think, or yeah, swept and garnished, he will go find other demons more strong than himself and invite them in. And so the second state of that man is worse than the first, right? And that's not perfectly quoted, but close enough. So what condition is that man, according to Jesus, than it was the first? Worse. Why? Well, he certainly doesn't have God in the center of his life, and he certainly doesn't have the Lord Jesus as Lord of his heart, his mind, and his soul, because the demons are inside there. So what's the problem? Come to destroy us. That poor man who is driven, who is occupied, whose driving force in his heart is not Christ, the Holy Spirit, or the Father, is driven by who? The demons, the disembodied spirits first spoken of, well, in Genesis chapter 3, I guess. Jude talks about them, Genesis 6, 4, Isaiah, all over the place. But those demons who loved the body of pigs rather than the air, and when they fell down under the water, they found something else to go into. They cause a destruction if they stay in a man. So that if that man died that very day, he would go to destruction, to the lake of fire, not intended for humanity, because Jesus came to redeem it. Did you come to destroy us, is what the text says. The next word out of this, its mouth, is this. I recall you. Most translations say, I know. You could translate it, I know. You could say, I know you. You could also translate it, I recall you. I prefer, I recall you, because he knew him before. Just like he says, I know you. I know you, whom you are. The demon knows who this is. Not because he has super intelligence. He's not like God. But he recalls who this is. The devil, Jesus says in another place, through his apostles say, the demons also know him and shudder. See, knowing Jesus is not the same thing as faith. This devil knows him and indeed is shuddering. And the apostles observed it later and wrote of it, said it exactly that way. Knowing Jesus is not the same thing as faith, trusting Jesus. This demon, this it does not trust Jesus. Because he's saying, have you come to torment us? One of the other gospel writers that I'm not preaching on says, adds, before the time. So I'm not going to tell you about that. I couldn't help myself. Sorry. I'm still learning to preach on the text before me. Take me 20 years, but we're getting there. Now what does Jesus do? Jesus rebuked it, saying, be quiet. Come out of him. That's all Jesus said. What happened next? The other gospel writers say different things. Mark tells us he convulses him. What would probably look to us like a seizure. And the unclean spirit, only one again. See, if I'd have paid attention while I was translating, I would have never translated it we. That's why it hit me like a ton of bricks this morning. Also crying a great cry. In the original language, it's kind of cool because that's like a Hebrewism. That's the way Hebrews talk. But Mark's writing in Greek to Jews and to Greeks. And yeah, whatever. It came out of him. That demon had no choice but to obey. Why? Because this is the Lord, God Almighty. But they were all astonished. All of them were made to be astonished. They weren't astonished of themselves. They were made to be astonished. 
It came from outside of them upon them. They were made to be astonished in order that so much so that they began to dispute among themselves. What the heck is this? Some new teaching with authority? This isn't like anything they're used to. I know that I don't preach the way some other guys do, and it's not because I'm Jesus. But when Jesus tells me words, I don't mamby-pamby around with them. When Jesus says, I forgive you, I say his words, I forgive you too. Because I'm not afraid if you think I'm goofy. That's what he says. If he says, whosoever sins you forgive shall have been forgiven, I'm going to tell you that. Why? Because that's exactly what he says. So when you get there, they're already forgiven. He forgave them here. That's what he had said. The words matter. So if you're suffering in this life, you don't have to remain there. God will take it and ease your pain. He says this, he who is weary and heavily burdened, come to me. And, and he doesn't say, I will give you rest as if it's something to hand over. He says, I will rest you. It means something different all entirely. He says, jump into me. Get outside yourself. That's not something I can explain in five minutes. But it means come into me and get out of you. Get out of your life into me. Jump out of whatever you're in and get into me. Because that ain't working. The same thing that happens to this unclean spirit. Come out. And it wasn't an easy thing. Notice the difference between this week and last week. When Jesus said to the apostles, come, immediately they followed. When he said, come out in this one, it wasn't an easy thing. It was hard. And there was some trouble for the man in which these troubles resided. That coming out caused some violence in his body. Sometimes when you've been dabbling in things you shouldn't have been doing, including things in your mind, it's hard to get out. And it hurts. And that's why I say, I'd get back to it later. That's why we don't dabble with things. We don't have Ouija boards in our houses. Why? Because they're a gateway to things, to spirits. We don't do seances. We don't get involved with things that are dark, magic. We don't do poem readings and astrology. Why? Because they're part of the dark arts that have a way the demons come through. Yeah, you can think I'm crazy. Go ahead. Have at it. The unclean spirits can't wait. But you might think, well, okay, he's talking about just that kind of crazy stuff. Now I got other stuff too. Greed, gluttony, laziness, envy, all those kinds of things. The unclean spirits hover around all the things that God tells you not to do. Adultery, drunkenness, altered states of mind, whether it's be with liquor or drugs. I'm not Lily White. I've participated in many things. Thanks be to God, not adultery. Because my dear wife doesn't deserve it. That leaves scars on you you can't erase. Because it puts them on somebody else. Just like abuse of another person. You can't take those things away when you hurt other people. You can ask forgiveness, and they can forgive you, but they don't forget. And it's not reasonable to ask them to. Some can put it so far back that God allows them. But that's why Moses permitted divorce, because of the hardness of our hearts. We can't forget the sins sometimes that people do. We can release the guilt, but we can't forget sometimes that things happen. When you can, it's a wondrous work of God. 
When you can get past that, it's a miracle. God does it. And it happens. Miracle happens all the time. We sang about it before the sermon today because we believe it's true. God works these things. I've seen them with my own eyes. He still does these things. You've noticed I rarely use my chair. And I hardly use my cane. I don't know why, but I'm thankful. For over 20 years, I could hardly walk. I still can't stand for a long time, but I can walk unaided right now. I haven't been able to do that in 20 years. I don't want to exaggerate. In the last eight for sure, I think, I don't know. I, I lose track of time. It's been a long, long, long time. God does work miracles. Sometimes they're quick, sometimes they're over time. But it came out of them. And they were made to be all astonished. This new teaching, because he commands the spirits. This isn't the first time it happened. And they even obey him. And straightway, the third one, the final bun to the hamburger. His report came out everywhere in every neighboring place about Galilee. Now, Galilee isn't close to Jerusalem. It's way, way up there. It's even past the region called Samaria. That's why they call it Galilee of the Gentiles. Jesus up there preaching to Jews that hung back after the captivity of Babylon. Remember, Jesus says, I'm but here for the lost sons of the tribe of Israel. He is in Galilee of the Gentiles. He's in enemy territory, behind enemy lines, beginning the battle. And he's proving he's up to it. And at the end of the epiphany, he's been right in the heart of enemy territory, on the top of the mountain where they were supposed to have come down from heaven, on the top of Mount Hermon. And he will be transfigured right there, right on the top of the mountain where at the bottom is the cave and the idol and the temple of Pan. The God of all things. That's what pan means in Greek. Everything or all. Caesarea Philippi. Which is why they were confused. The disciples when Jesus took them there at nighttime when they did all that stuff. But now I digress. His report went out everywhere. Such that we're talking about it yet today. Jesus has come into the world not to be a lace-wearing Sunday preacher. He has invaded the world. I've said it a gazillion times. On Christmas morning, Christ, the very Lord of heaven, earth, and under the earth, invaded the world as a baby in swaddling clothes and has grown up and has taken the mantle of general, commander-in-chief of the heavens, and the earth and under the earth at age 30. And he was Christed by God, anointed. He became Christ in the Jordan and immediately went out and did battle with Satan. And to prove it's true, then he went out immediately and began doing the work. And that's why in our psalm and in our liturgy today, we glorify the works of God. Jesus is doing battle immediately. Not with magic, but with the word from his mouth and he'll do it to you like he did just this morning when he releases you from your sins by his word he that believeth and is baptized is his word not mine and if you believe it it's true if you reject it go to the seance go to the astrology folks and see how it's working for you Stay keeping your anger, hold inside. Don't let it go. Hang on to your bottles. Hang on to the booze. I know what it's like. I suffer from depression and PTSD. And when I came back home, I tried to drown myself in it. It helped outwardly, but it's a bad place. God delivered me from it. In Christ, we're all okay. We are all the same, but he loves us. And says, I forgive you all your sins. 
And I know the pain you're in and have been because I've taken it on myself. But I've come to set you free. And one day we'll vindicate every wrong. That's what he says. So come in me and be rested. For I will rest you. Me as a person. I myself and no other. For there are no other gods, even though there be they who call themselves gods and will even accept the worship as if they were gods. But I tell you, no. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. We worship his name as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One true God to life everlasting. God grant you to believe it for your soul's salvation and to the praise of his glorious name. Amen. Now may the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.